Welcome back. Today I want to talk about instability in the Gram-Schmidt process. So first I should give you a rundown on the classical Gram-Schmidt. Suppose I have some vectors v1, v2, up to vn. These are linearly independent vectors in some vector space v, which I need to assume is an inner product space, like rn, or a function space with the integral inner product. Suppose I have a unit vector u, and it's got length 1, and some other vector v, and I wish that v was perpendicular to u, so how can I make it so? Well, if you look at the orthogonal projection of v onto u, that's the little red arrow that I've drawn here, that's easy to compute. It's a multiple of u, and that multiple is just the dot product of v with u. If I subtract off that short little red arrow from v, I get this blue arrow, which is perpendicular to u. That's what I want. So that's called orthogonalizing v with respect to u. So uh, here's how I start the algorithm. I'll make u hat, u1 hat into v1, and define u1 proper to be u1 hat divided by the norm of u1 hat. Next, I'll make u2 hat to be v2 minus the orthogonal projection of v2 onto u1. And so that's pretty easy to compute, just like that picture that's on the right. Now that I have u2 hat, I can normalize it into u2 proper. u2 proper will be u2 hat divided by the norm of u2 hat. And I continue. Now u3 is neither is not orthogonal to u1 or u2, so I make it so. I take v3 and I subtract off the orthogonal projection of v3 onto u1, and subtract from that the orthogonal projection of v3 onto u2, like so. Now that I have u3 hat, I can normalize it into u3. u3 proper is u3 hat divided by the norm of u3 hat. I continue in this fashion until the end, so at the kth step I'll define uk hat to be vk minus a sum of orthogonal projections. Which ones? Well, all the orthogonal projections of vks onto uis, vk onto uis where the uis range i ranging from 1 to k minus 1, all of the previous, previously created uh, orthogonal basis vectors. And then uk will be the normalized version of this. And so at the end of the day, I will have started with some independent vectors and gotten an orthonormal basis. That was the point. Uh, here, of course, k ranges from 1 to n. Now there's a danger in doing this, and the danger is the following. When you are doing this on a computer, when you are implementing this uh, on a finite precision machine, uh, it is vulnerable to rounding errors in a way that it is not vulnerable when you're just doing the computation by hand. Uh, your brain does infinite precision arithmetic, does exact arithmetic, and the computer does not. And this is a problem, as we'll see a little bit later in the video. Okay, now let me run through the modified Gram-Schmidt process that we talked about in class. Suppose that I have some vectors v1 through vn, and they're linearly independent, and they're in some inner product space v. How can we modify the Gram-Schmidt process to account for some of this instability? Well, I start the algorithm the same. I define u1 hat to be v1, and then u1 proper to be u1 hat divided by its norm. And now, at this stage, I modify every other vector. I go into memory and I change all of the vectors v2 through vn. So I'll define, um, I'll define v2, 2 uh, here. And really, in essence, I'm replacing v2 in my computer by v2, 2. I'm going to make v2 minus the inner product of v2 with u1 on u1. That's exactly the the, I'm orthogonalizing v2 with respect to u1, and I'll define v3 2 to be v3 minus the inner product v3 u1 u1, and v4 2 and v5 2 and so on. vk2 will be vk minus the orthogonal projection of vk onto u1. So I change all of the other vectors in my machine I orthogonalize all of them with respect to my new u1 right now as the next step of my algorithm, as k runs from 2 to n. And now I take the first newly modified vector, and I make it, I normal, I make it into u2 hat, 
and then I normalize that into U2 proper. Uh, so I take V22 over norm of V22, that is U2. And now I go through memory again, and I modify every other vector, or orthogonalize all of them with respect to this new U2. So I replace V3 with V33, which is going to be V32. Sorry, I replace V32 with V32 minus V32 U2, U2. Again, I'm going to replace V32 with V32 minus the orthogonal projection of it onto U2. And V43 is going to be V42 minus the orthogonal projection of V42 onto U2, and so on. So I'll have VK3 as VK3, uh, uh, VK2 minus the orthogonal projection of VK2 onto U2. So I orthogonalize all of my remaining vectors against U2 as uh, k runs from 3 to n. And then my u3 hat will be v3 3, and then I'll just normalize that to my u3 proper, u3 hat over norm of u3 hat. So that's now a unit vector. And I keep going in this vein. Every time I get a new orthonormal basis vector, I re-orthogonalize all of the remaining vectors against it. So uk hat is going to be vkk every time, and vkk is vkk minus 1 minus the projection of vkk minus 1 onto uk minus 1 as k runs essentially here from 2 to n. And finally, once I have this uk hat, uh, I normalize it, uh, divide by its norm to get uk proper. So now that we've seen the rundown of these two processes, um, we'll do a quick example. But before I say that, I want to point out that if you do this in exact arithmetic, both of these will give you the exact same orthonormal basis. There will not be any difference in exact arithmetic. The difference comes, the numerical stability in this modified Gram-Schmidt process comes from taking into account machine error. Okay, so let's start our example. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose a number epsilon that is a very small number. And this number is going to be so small that when I plug it into my computer and ask it to do some computation with it, it'll compute, for example, that when I add 1 plus this number epsilon, I'll get 1. So you can do this on your calculator. You probably only have 9-digit precision on your calculator, and you'll find uh, that there are numbers that are small enough that you can type them in, and when you add them to 1, you'll just get 1 back. This will imply that 1 minus epsilon is 1, and 1 plus epsilon squared is 1, and so on. It won't be able to tell the difference. It will essentially, for the purposes of computation, think that epsilon is just like 0. Epsilon is very small. So here are some vectors. Uh, v1 is 1 epsilon 0, 0. V2 is 1, 0 epsilon 0. And V3 is 1, 0, 0 epsilon. Let's do the classical Gram-Schmidt algorithm to this and see what happens. So again, you can enter these into your computer, and it's fine. It's only when you ask it to do computations that things go a little bit haywire. So the classical algorithm says, well, to get u1, I'll just normalize v1. OK, fine, no problem. They're all pretty symmetric, so it's not like it was going to matter which one I picked to normalize first. So I divide by the norm. The norm is 1 plus epsilon squared in a square root and multiply by v1. Now, 1 plus epsilon squared, uh, that's 1 as far as my computer is concerned, because epsilon is small enough. So if that's a 1, then u1 is really just the same as v1, 1 epsilon 0, 0. OK, fine. Now, how do I get the next orthogonal basis vector? Well, I define a u2 hat to be v2 minus the orthogonal projection that's uh, of v2 onto uh, u1 which is v2 minus v2 dot u1 times u1, and we can just compute that. So v2 is 1, 0, epsilon 0, and I subtract off, let's see, if I take the dot product, it's a 1. Let's see, 1 times 1 plus uh, 0 times epsilon plus epsilon times 0 plus uh, 0 times 0. I just did the dot product, uh, times u1. So u1, remember, was the same as v1. That's 1, epsilon 0, 0. And if I compute all that out, I get 1, 0, epsilon, 0, minus, that's just 1, 
uh, one epsilon zero zero, and so the ones cancel. I get zero minus epsilon epsilon zero. Okay, so that's u two hat, and I'm going to want to try to normalize this. Now, I don't want to make the mistake of trying to plug epsilon in to my computer and take epsilon squared plus epsilon squared, because uh, that's going to be zero, and I'm going to divide by it, and sad things will happen. Instead, I'll combine that epsilon squared plus epsilon squared together in the denominator and pull it out and pull it out of the square root, and then I can cancel it with the epsilons that are in my vector. Okay, so that's exactly what we'll do. So u2, the normal version, once I cancel the epsilons, I'll get 0, uh, minus 1 over root 2, 1 over root 2, 0. And this is a perfectly good uh, unit vector. We're happy with it. So now I need to make a u3 hat. To get u3 hat, I need, in the classical Gram-Schmidt algorithm, to take v3 and subtract off the orthogonal projection of v3 onto u1 and subtract off of that the orthogonal projection of v3 onto u2. Okay, well we can just do that. This is a bunch of dot products. So v3 is 1, 0, 0 epsilon. I subtract off, let's see, v3 dot u1. v3 is 1, 0, 0 epsilon. u1 is 1 epsilon 0, 0. So when I take the dot product I just get 1. And uh, that's a my multiplying u1. Okay, 1 epsilon 0, 0. That's the first bit. And then I also need to subtract off the orthogonal projection onto v2. Not v2, onto u2. Okay, so if I take the dot product of v3 with u2, it's 0. So it doesn't really matter what I write in this vector, because I'm multiplying by 0. So what do I get? I get 1, 0, 0, epsilon minus 1, epsilon 0, 0, or... 0, minus epsilon, 0, epsilon. Okay, great. So uh, I'm going to normalize that. And so, again, you divide by the norm, and that's uh, epsilon root 2. Cancel the epsilons, and you'll find 0, minus 1 over root 2, 0, 1 over root 2. Now, in here in just a second, I want to check what happened with our orthogonal basis. So we're going to go to the next slide, and I'll write up all the vectors there so we can just get started. So make sure that you have these written down in your notes. Okay, so here are these vectors, v1, v2, and v3, and u1, u2, and u3. So, problem. We were trying to get an orthonormal basis out of u1, u2, and u3. That was the whole point of the Scram-Schmidt process. So let's just compute some inner products and see. I mean, they look okay. They look like the sort of things, vectors, they look unit vectors at least. Uh, they're supposed to be orthonormal. Let's compute their inner products. Okay, we compute u1 dot u2. And I get um, epsilon minus epsilon over root 2. This is okay. This is not such a big deal. Uh, epsilon is small, so epsilon over root 2 is still going to be pretty small. It's not orthogonal. It's not zero, but they're close. Uh, similarly, when I compute u1 dot u3, uh, again, I get the same thing, minus epsilon over root 2, which is you know, still, it's okay. It's not zero, but there's, I mean, it's machine, machine precision. But when I compute u2 dot u3, something awful happens. I get a half. A half is not okay. A half is too big. This is far from being an orthonormal basis. They're independent, but they are not orthonormal. The classical Gram-Schmidt process failed us. And the reason that it failed us is that our incorrect normalization of, of v1, of, of u1, propagated all the way through all the rest of our computations. And we didn't deal with it carefully enough. So that's what the modified Gram-Schmidt process fixes. So let's see what happens when we compute with the same three vectors, with a modified system. Again, the, the difficulty is that that inc incorrect calculation in the norm of v1 followed through in a damaging way through the rest of the calculation. That's the problem. So let's see what happens in the new version. So let's make the same computation with the modified Gram-Schmidt process. Same vectors, v1, v2, and v3. 1, 0, uh, 1 epsilon 0, 0, 1, 0, epsilon 0, 1, 0, 0, epsilon. u1 is the same. It's v1 over the norm v1, and the same problem, I mean the same yeah, the same problem goes through. Uh, when you compute the norm, it's 1, as far as your machine cares. So let's modify all of the rest of the vectors 
accordingly. So we replace V2 by V2, 2. That's V2 minus the orthogonal projection of V2 onto U1. That's that. Uh, okay, and when we do that computation, we get the exact same thing that we got before. Uh, that's 0 minus epsilon, epsilon 0. Fine. We also replace V3. V3. We also replace V3 with V3, 2. We go through and we orthogonalize V3 with respect to U1. So we subtract off of V3 the orthogonal projection of V3 onto U1. And when you compute that, you'll find a familiar looking vector. That's 0 minus epsilon. OK, so let's just do it. Uh, v3 is 1, 0, 0, epsilon. I subtract off v3 dot u1 is 1. So I subtract off 1 times u1. And we've done that computation before. You get 0 minus epsilon, 0, epsilon. Now, when it's time for me to take u2, I go through and I find v2, 2. That's uh, going to be u2 hat. And so then I'll just normalize it to get u2. And when I do that computation, it's the same computation that I did in the last slide, so I'm going to go quickly. Uh, it's 1 over root 2 times this vector, 0 minus 1, 1, 0. Now I go through and I modify all of the remaining v's. Well, there's only one remaining v because there's only three vectors here, so I make a v3, 3. That's the... I'm sorry. Let me erase this. Let's try again. Modify all the remaining vectors, so that's only v3, 2 is left. I replace v3, 2 by v3, 2 minus its orthogonal projection, it says minus, uh, by v3, 3, which is the orthogonal, v is, which is v3, 2 minus the orthogonal projection of v3, 2 onto u2. Replace v3, 2 by its orthogonalization with respect to u2. Okay, so I had v3, 2, and I subtract off v3, 2 dot u2. Uh, what is that? That is, let's see, there's a 1 over root 2, and uh, minus epsilon times minus 1 is 1. Okay, so it's epsilon over root 2 times 0 minus 1 over root 2, 1 over root 2, 0. Okay, well, this is new. So when I subtract all this stuff together, uh, when I add these two vectors, I get 0 minus epsilon over 2, minus epsilon over 2, epsilon, because the 1 over root 2s multiply together to be a half. So now when I normalize that, uh, so that's the thing. I'm going to take u3 to be v33 um, normalized. Let me divide it by its norm. And what's the norm of this v33? Uh, this is square root of epsilon squared plus uh, epsilon squared over 4 plus another epsilon squared over 4, which altogether is, uh, uh, and you so you multiply that by v33. And if you do a little bit of computation, and again pull out the epsilons in a clever way, it's not that clever, uh, you're going to get um, to cancel all of the epsilons that you had to deal with, and you have 0, minus 1 over root 6, minus 1 over root 6, 2 over root 6. Okay, so now let's go through on the next slide and see if we can take all of the dot products that we uh, took before and see if this modified Gram-Schmidt process has fixed matters, and we'll see that it has. Okay, so let's just verify that what we have, uh, u1, u2, and u3 from the modified Gram-Schmidt, is close to being an orthonormal basis. Uh, of course it's not. Your u1, epsilon is small but not zero. u1 is not orthonor is not uh, a unit vector, but still. Uh, and your vectors, again, u1 and u2, we, we took the dot product last time, they're the same vectors. Uh, it's minus epsilon over 2, over root 2, and it's okay, epsilon is small. u1 dot u3, this time, is even smaller, it's minus epsilon over root 6. It's still fine. Um, we, you know, the machine, this is smaller than, than the machine error. This is, the, the machine can't tell that these aren't orthogonal. And u2 and u3, glory be, uh, are genuinely orthogonal which is exactly what you wanted. So what you have now is something that's much closer to being an orthonormal basis than what we had in the classical case. In the classical Gram-Schmidt uh, algorithm, we saw a dramatic deviation from orthonormality due to the way that the error propagated through. So in the new version, we deal with that by 
or normalizing everything with respect to each new orthogonal basis vector. Now, this is not the implementation that somebody like Mathematica might actually use. Uh, you would probably use householder transformations, but we're not going to cover those in this class. Uh, there is a short section on that in the text that is absolutely worth reading. It is fascinating uh, to see the application of geometry in this context, but we don't have time for it in this class.